This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 332 was recorded on July 14th, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Lynn Alden returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll take a deep dive on energy markets and the tug of war between recession fears pulling oil prices lower and tight physical markets implying they're already too low. Then we'll look at inflation, the U.S. dollar, treasury yields, and what Lynn expects them to do if inflation worsens, and much more. Then be sure to stay tuned for our postgame segment when Patrick's chart deck will be titled Perspectives on Market Breadth. And finally, a quick production note. Our research roundup email may be delayed this week by as much as a few hours after the podcast is released on Thursday evening. Please bear with us. It's coming very soon after the podcast, we promise. And if you just can't wait, you can always log into your account at macrovoices.com where you can access the download links for Lynn Alden's chart deck. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Eric, Let's jump to that S&P 500. And while over the last, uh, let, let's say, month, we've seen a number of short-term rallies where the bulls have been able to put together a couple hundred S&P points over a couple of days, the pattern of uh, failed rallies and markets rolling over just stays so dominant. And I want to talk about it in the post game a little bit, but uh, uh, what's your take on this price action and how things have developed this week? Well, holy 9.1% CPI print, Batman. Uh, It seems like the inflation print really, really was a macro shock to a lot of markets. We, you know, oil continuing to crash, U.S. dollar index breaking out, all this other stuff is going on this week. Uh, Inflation really isn't transitory after all, it would seem. And, you know, who could have seen that coming? I think I heard it on a podcast someplace a few months ago. On a related note, um, Bank of Canada surprised with a 100 basis point hike. Uh, The odds of a 100 basis point U.S. Fed hike jumped initially to 35 percent. Then Wall Street Journal's Nick Timoreo says not to expect the Fed to follow suit. Uh, Stick with 75. Now, Nick is believed by a lot of people to sort of be the designated leaker for uh, information from the Fed. So that statement spiked stocks back up to unchanged. So we saw a very positive reaction to that reassurance that now the Fed's not thinking about 100. But then Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic was asked about the possibility of 100 basis points in July. He responded, hey, everything is in play. Inflation is not moving in a positive direction here. But stocks only sold off just a little bit on that. And then this morning, we had another Fed governor uh, opine that, look, 100 100 basis points is not uh, on the table, and stocks rallied more appreciably. So the question to ask about this stock market is why there's really been no downside volatility so far. How could it be that equities are basically doing nothing of substance? Yeah, okay, they're sold off today a bit. No big deal compared to the carnage that's going on in other markets. It beats me. I'm definitely going to ask Lynn Alden that because I would have thought with the U.S. dollar continuing to break out, commodities crashing, uh, inflation through the roof, I would have thought we'd see a crashing stock market, and we haven't. So if a 40-year high print on inflation against consensus expectations doesn't make the stock market crash, what will? Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm trying to figure it out. It seems to me that we ought to be seeing much more downside, much more selling in stocks. And I think they've been remarkably resilient considering everything else that's going on. All right, Eric, let's move on to the dollar because you were just mentioning that dollar strength. And well, I mean, the Dixie uh, cleared temporarily 109 on the upside, but the big one is obviously that Euro USD uh, trading now uh, below uh, parity and uh, for the first time in uh, in several decades. And so uh, the currencies are uh, are moving and there's some real momentum there. What's your take on all of this? 
Well, Patrick, the dollar breakout continues in earnest, just as we predicted that it would here on Macro Voices. I say it still has plenty more room to run. I think at one point this morning, we actually saw a 109 handle on the Dixie, back down to 108 spot 71, as I'm speaking right now around 1.30 in the afternoon on Thursday. Uh, I think it has plenty more room to run. I don't have an upside target. I would say, though, that, you know, think of the dollar index as the global civil unrest uh, anticipation index. The more the dollar strengthens, the more problems it's going to cause around the world. Right now, we've got a lot of tension in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think it's going to get worse around the world as things get more and more expensive to people outside the United States. Uh, So it's going to depend on data and geopolitics that we can't predict. But big picture, I I think that this is probably going to be the last great rally for the USD. And I don't mean, you know, in the next week or two. I mean, over the next few years, I think we'll see the dollar continue to appreciate to what might be its final high. I think by the time this decade is out, maybe Luke Groman's view that the dollar is going to fade from its present role as the dominant global reserve currency is going to be realized. But for now, I see the dollar continuing to strengthen. Eric, let's move on to oil. And, uh, you know, when when we failed below that 104, 105 level, in just a few days, we wiped out, we, we got to the 90 handle on, on crude. That happened so quick. Uh, what's your take on uh, what's happening here in the oil markets? Well, let's start with EIA inventory. We actually had builds this week, crude oil building, at least on paper, 3.3 million barrels. Now, it was really a drawdown of 3.6 million barrels if you exclude the 6.9 million barrels that was taken out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Cushing, Oklahoma, building a very much needed 316,000 barrels, still well below 25 million barrels, which is maybe an operational comfort level for Cushing. So it's still at a critically low level. Gasoline building a massive 5.0. 0.8 0.8 million barrels, distillates building 2.7 million barrels. So that's a very bearish report. Uh, interestingly enough, the tape action, the market kind of shrugged it off, at least initially. There was a little bit of a dip, and then the market actually moved higher. Now, it has since moved considerably lower, but it was not a reaction to inventory. U.S. production ticked down 100,000 barrels to 12 million even. The big picture here is we are in the midst of a tug of war. Uh, the macro bears are basically basically becoming increasingly aware of the imminent global recession that we've been talking about for a couple of months here on Macro Voices. Also, renewed China lockdown fears are exacerbating the selling in oil. A lot of people are starting to get this crazy idea in their head of, oh my gosh, here it is, March of 2020, redux. We're going to to have negative oil prices again. Not going to happen, folks. This is not 2020. Totally different story. Meanwhile, the bulls are the people who actually understand crude oil fundamentals, and they're looking at a supply side crisis. And yeah, sure, demand destruction is certain to occur because I predict that this recession will be longer and deeper than almost anybody is predicting. So there's lots of demand destruction coming. I don't think it's going to be enough, and I think that we're headed much higher in oil prices. Now, I explained those views last week. It was kind of a a non-consensus view. It became mainstream the very next day when Bloomberg's Javier Blas said essentially the same thing on Twitter last Friday morning. Another terrific gem from Javier, who's a brilliant guy, as Brent was crashing through $100 on Tuesday... A physical trader, that's the guy in the physical market where they not just speculating about macro, they actually deal with real oil. A physical trader bid $5.85 a barrel premium over Brent for 40s crude. 40s is the second largest oil field in the North Sea. That's the highest physical over futures premium ever bid in the last 14 years, and that bid found no takers. Conclusion, the physical market guys understand that this is a supply insufficiency. It's a critical situation. And yeah, demand destruction is coming, but it's not going to be enough. WTI tanked more than $7 lower. This time, it was a little bit of a different game. Last time, last week, when we had the big sell-off in uh, WTI crude oil futures, the time spreads were actually strengthening slightly. They didn't sell off at all. This time, the time spreads were off. Not as much as normal conditions, but much more than last week. So we still have evidence of a very tight physical market. 
Meanwhile, there is a new doomsday scenario that everybody's talking about, which is the July 22nd scheduled restart of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Now, the backstory here is that Nord Stream 1, the pipeline that supplies natural gas from Russia to Europe, and Germany is probably the most vulnerable European country that depends on that pipeline, that was all shut down for maintenance, scheduled maintenance, and it's supposed to be turned back on on July 22nd. That's next Friday. But there's a very real logistics issue, which is in order to turn it back on, the Russians need a gas turbine that was sent to Canada for repair because that's the only place where they could repair this thing. And, well, guess what? The Canadians were not allowed to repair it and send it back to Russia because of ill-conceived Western sanctions. So because of sanctions, the equipment that's needed to start the thing back up is kind of stuck in Canada. That's been overcome. The Canadians have waived the uh, the sanctions for the purposes of getting that turbine back, and they've promised to send it back to Russia. But Gazprom has still expressed a little bit of skepticism as to whether they're going to be able to get it turned back on by July 22nd as planned. Now, that has led a whole bunch of people to speculate, oh my gosh, this is all a smokescreen. It's the big cover job. What's really going on here is Putin doesn't plan to turn it back on at all. He's going to starve Europe for gas. The reason that they did this scheduled maintenance was to, to create a dodge so that we, we wouldn't know what was coming and, you know, get ready for the big surprise. Um Frankly, I think it's likely that the pipeline will not come back on on July 22nd, and that will probably add to that speculation. But I think the speculation that this is some evil plan by Vladimir Putin is very badly misplaced. I think it really is about logistics and the pipeline. Why do I say that? Because Putin is not that stupid or incompetent. The, the time to make that move, and oh, don't get me wrong, I definitely think Putin is going to make that move. The time to make the move where you shut off the gas to Europe is not in July when nobody really needs it for heat. You do that move in October so that Europeans are facing freezing conditions without Russian gas. They don't have the heat that they need in order to stay warm. And Americans would then be forced to drive to the U.S. midterm elections with $8 gasoline in their gas tanks. That would be the much more strategic way if Putin is going to shut off the gas to do it. So thinking that he's going to shut off the gas in the middle of July just doesn't make any sense to me, but we'll see what happens. I do think, though, that it will probably be delayed beyond July 22nd. That will probably lead to a lot of panic and speculation that this is the, the big moment. Let's just remember Jim Bianco's quote from probably, I think, one of the most prescient things we've heard on Macro Voices this year was when Jim Bianco said, look, Putin might be a bad guy, but he's a competent bad guy. He's a very smart bad guy. He knows how to impose lots of damage. And shutting off the gas in the middle of July just does not seem strategic to me. The other big thing that's going on is President Biden is uh, going to meet with Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia this week. I think the Wall Street Journal put it best when they said that the president who seeks to humble Mohammed bin Salman is more likely to be humbled by Mohammed bin Salman. Let's look at the best case and the worst case here. The best case would be that somehow, miraculously, Saudi Arabia is, is just so wooed by President Biden's uh, amazing uh, charm and, uh, and charisma that they agree, look, we've only got about a million and a half barrels of spare capacity, but we're going to immediately, just because we want to help you out, President Biden, we're going to crank the, the screws up. We're going to produce as much oil as we possibly can. And furthermore, we're going to go a step beyond that. We're going to deny the rest of the world access to that oil. We're going to reserve at least a million barrels a day of that spare capacity just for the United States. Now, that would never, ever happen. I'm giving you the, the most unrealistic best case. Well, guess what? If you really got that unrealistic concession out of Saudi Arabia, what the U.S. would get is an extra 1 million barrels per day. In other words, exactly the same amount that they're currently draining every single day out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is completely unsustainable. So all you could possibly hope for in the best case is that when the U.S. finally comes to its senses and stops draining its Strategic Petroleum Reserve at a time when it needs it more than it's ever needed it before, uh, then it would be a break-even, and it still wouldn't solve any problems. That's the best case. 
The worst case that I can think of is President Biden further offends Mohammed bin Salman. And come fall, Russia cuts off the gas first around October or so, and then cuts off the oil supply. Biden freaks out and tells Mohammed bin Salman, you have to help and help now. Russia has cut off our oil supply. This is an absolute crisis. You've got to give us all of the oil. And Mohammed bin Salman calmly responds, no, actually, Mr. President, we just inked a long-term strategic deal with Russia and China and India. And so since you've told your citizens so many times on television that the United States is energy independent, a statement that confused us because it didn't seem that way to us, but uh, it seems like you've got enough energy of your own. You don't need us. At least that's what you told your voters. Uh, So we've decided that we're done doing business with you. We're going to part ways. We're not going to make any Saudi oil available ever again, you're going to have to find your own. Russia will supply our military backing going forward. We've decided to change our alliance and partner with Russia and China on the road ahead because they are now bigger consumers than you are. Oh, and P.S., thanks so much for draining your SPR because without your help, we wouldn't have been able to really put you in this incredibly vulnerable, defenseless position that you're now in. But thanks to you trying to buy votes by draining your strategic petroleum reserve at the most unstrategic time, we are in a position to say, sorry, buddy, you're out of luck. Now, folks, that is absolutely not a prediction. That is the worst case I can think of. And yet, Yes, it could very easily lead to nuclear war. So the stakes are incredibly high here. Consider that the resolution to the Cold War, which nobody could figure out how to resolve for, you know, decades and decades, was the U.S. finally realizing that the only viable alternative to nuclear war was to cripple the USSR economically. Now, what if hypothetically Saudi Arabia, Russia and China were conspiring to do the same thing to the United States? How would their actions look any different from exactly what we see going on right now? Seems to me like what we're seeing is completely consistent with what they would be doing. If you really wanted to play Biden for a sucker, what you do is you jack up the price of oil just enough to sucker him into emptying his strategic petroleum reserve. And then when it was actually empty, you'd cut off the oil completely, crippling the country, leaving its military unable to defend the country. And boy, well, you know what? I've gone on long enough about this. If you're uh, not completely sick of it, I did a full hour with George Gammon on on another podcast about this subject. That is linked in your research roundup email. Bottom line on crude oil, oil is going to continue selling off until the sellers run out. So the real question is how many sellers are left and how much do they have left? to sell. Well, courtesy of our good friend Ola Hansen at Saxo Bank, the COT analysis, Commitment of Traders Report analysis, says we're getting pretty close. We're seeing a collapse uh, really only uh, akin to the March of 2020, where there was an outright collapse in speculative long open interest in crude oil futures. We're seeing that same collapse occurring right now. Uh, But I don't think that the reality of a deep global recession is fully priced in yet. So another wave lower seems entirely possible. Now, this morning, we went down and tested and actually traded well below the 200-day continuation chart moving average. We didn't get all the way down to the contract chart 200-day moving average. That's down at 88 spot 45 on front month WTI. I won't be surprised if we get down to that. That would be a logical bottom, but who knows? It it could go another 10 bucks lower. I'm definitely going to ask Lynn Alden about this, and we'll talk more about crude oil, if you're not sick of it already, in this week's feature interview. Uh, Eventually, though, we'll run out of sellers, and then, guess what? They're going to realize that energy prices really can go up in a recession. And when the herd realizes that They got it backwards and they bailed out for the wrong reason, because even though the recession fears were realized, we've still got a supply driven problem. 
that's going to, I think, cause everybody to pile back into this trade on the long side all at once. And that's when shit really gets real and we go north of 150 bucks on crude oil. By the way, Goldman Sachs reiterated a very similar view this morning. So I don't think that the selling is completely done yet. Now, there is an argument you could make, which is this morning we tested and traded well below that continuation 200-day, but we've definitely, as I'm speaking now, recovered well above it. So, you know, maybe that was the final bottom. It might be, but I kind of doubt it. Feels like uh, this is not totally done yet. At some point, though, we're going to go in the other direction, and the next move up is going to be bigger than this colossal move down that we've had from $124. All right, Eric, let's uh, move on to uh, precious metals and particularly gold, which uh, as that U.S. dollar has been ripping higher, has just continued to pressure the precious metal. And we've uh, now printed 1700 on the downside. Uh, what's, uh, what's your thinking on gold here? Well, as you say, as the U.S. dollar goes up, gold goes down. And what you might hope for if you're a gold bull is you're going to say, yeah, but wait a minute. The market is going to see that inflation really is out of control and the market's going to be forward looking and look past the immediate what the dollar's doing and anticipate that the inflation trend means that surely gold has to go higher. Well, guess what? That's not happening. What's happening is the higher dollar means lower gold. Now, I was anticipating that the stock market, when it crashes, would drag gold with it. What we see is gold's, I don't know, I wouldn't say crashing, but gold looks much weaker to me than stocks do. I think stocks are going to start to look a lot weaker than they do right now. And when they do, I think it could get much worse for gold. Uh, I'm still long-term very bullish because when we get into what could be an escalation toward a nuclear war with Russia, which frankly is is the way this thing feels to me, like it's starting to to go, um, then gold is going to be very much in demand. But right now, it looks to me like we keep going uh, to the downside. All right, Eric, uh, let's wrap with uh, just touching on the 10-year Treasury yield, which uh, surprisingly is still under 3% in spite of that pretty high CPI print. Well, Patrick, that's exactly what I want to focus on is we're holding below 3% in the face of the epic CPI print, which you would have expected to be the, the panic that spikes the market higher. Remember the rule for knowing when markets have run out of steam, which is when news that should take them further in the undesired direction ends up not doing that. But what we're seeing here is that the CPI print, very unexpected 9.1% year over year increase in inflation, that's a big, scary, unexpected CPI print, should have been a scare spike to send treasury yields much higher. They barely moved and they're still below 3%. That seems to me like reasonably good evidence that maybe the uh, the upside move, at least for now, in Treasury yields is over. I can't come up with another explanation. Uh, maybe Harley Bassman has one and he'll email us as he always does when we talk about this stuff. We'll, we'll see what happens. Well, this week's feature interview guest is Lynn Alden, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Eric, why did we get Lynn back on the show this week? Well, Lynn is an absolutely brilliant macro strategist, but particularly she has been writing quite a bit recently about crude oil. She's focused on that. Her views are a little different than mine, but we come to very similar conclusions. And I think it's also just been about the right amount of time. We haven't had her on the show in quite a while. Also, inflation is clearly the the big theme right now. Lynn was one of the first people, I think her first two interviews on Macro Voices, the primary theme that she brought to us was, I think the, the first interview was called The Road to Inflation. Uh, she was predicting it long before we saw signs that it would happen. And then as it began to happen, she had more context and we thought, boy, what a perfect time to get her back. Well, Eric's interview with Lynn Alden is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, 
Contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Lynn Alden, founder of Lynn Alden Investment Strategy. Lynn produced a terrific slide deck to accompany today's interview. I strongly encourage you to download it as we will be referring to the charts and graphs that it contains throughout this interview. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Apologies if it may be delayed a couple of hours after the podcast this week due to some production issues. Please bear with us there. Once you've got it, though, I, I think you're going to love the graphs and charts that it contains. If you don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click the button that says looking for the downloads. Lynn, it's great to get you back on the show. I know you've been writing quite a bit about a subject that's very much near and dear to my heart, which is crude oil and energy in general. Why don't we start with the big picture? What's on your mind with respect to energy? I don't want to taint it too much with my own views, and uh, we'll get into some, some of those other views a little bit later on. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And so energy is obviously one of the key things affecting all markets, not not just obviously energy markets, but also impacting everything else because energy touches pretty much everything in our lives uh, financially and otherwise. And so you know, my view of the energy market over the past uh, year or more has been that supply side issues are starting to come to the forefront and that this is obviously going to cause significant inflationary pressures, both for the energy sector directly and then also for the, for the broader economy. And so generally speaking, commodities go through these very large capex cycles. There's, there's periods of time where you know, commodities are structurally oversupplied, prices are low, nobody wants to invest. There even, you know, in, in more recent terms, there could be other reasons why they don't invest, like a, a, an ESG overlay onto those financial reasons. But for a variety of reasons, nobody wants to invest in the space. But then if, over time of that not occurring, eventually you you work down the existing supply, right? So so dwells, wells start to run dry, demand starts to slowly creep up over time until you go back above equilibrium. And so then you start to get rising prices. And then more and more supply comes online, and some of those take many years, to, you know, for the bigger projects to bring online until eventually they overbuild, you know, cause a period of oversupply and low prices again. They start the whole cycle again, and th and this is a pretty long-term cycle. And so my contention for for a while now has been that we are entering, you know, a decade of uh, much tighter commodity supply in general and energy supply specifically, and we're starting to see that manifest this year. And my view is that it won't be a straight line. So I'm not trying to say, you know, chart oil on a week by week basis and, and make those specific calls. It's more about the fact that, you know, in, in the years ahead, through ups and downs, they were looking at structurally higher energy prices, most likely. Lynn, another topic that you've written quite a bit about is inflation. Now, to what extent is this oil price event that we're having about inflation in the economy? And to what extent is it about the Russian war? President Biden has, of course, described this as the Vladimir Putin price hike. Is that what's going on here or is there more to it? Great question. And, and I actually look back to three times I was on your show before. We, we, we centered the conversations around inflation. So my, my first appearance in mid-2020 was called The Road to Inflation. Uh, and then the next two appearances after that were really about how the you know, inflation is being driven in large part by the fiscal side. And so it's not just bank reserve creation this time around, unlike the 2008 crisis. This is actually, you know, significant fiscal stimulus that, that actually increased the money supply and broad circulation among most economic participants. And that, you know, people can take that extra money and go out and buy things with it. And so now, even though we're getting a pullback in terms of that money supply growth and that fiscal stimulus, those effects are still working their way through the system. And so my view is that it's the combination of the monetary inflation that we've seen, as well as that commodity cycle. And so, you know, if we look at slide three, for example, we can see over time, you know, there's there's very significant persistent growth in the broad money supply. And that is, of course, the unit of account that we're looking at when we're measuring oil prices. But then when you combine that with the fact that, you know, you have these these big commodity cycles, you know, bull markets in the 1970s when you had shortages, bull markets in the 2000s when you had shortages, you know, bull markets recently when we've had shortages, these represent these huge stepwise increases in, in the price of energy 
and then you go through a long consolidation phase. So my, my view is that it's both the unit of account going down significantly, basically significant you know, monetary debasement, broad money supply increases, as well as where we are in the commodity cycle. And when we look at the order of events, we started to get rising energy prices before the war. Um, that obviously added a lot of extra volatility and uncertainty onto energy prices. But it, it wasn't as though this was not happening before that, that war occurred. And then specifically, when we look at European natural gas prices, which are, which are arguably the, the craziest energy charts out there at the moment, uh, those also broke out in late 2021, which was, again, before any sort of a, a conflict began. And so I think what we're looking at structurally is that the increase in the broad money supply is part of what contributed to the breakout of energy prices because we basically increased people's demand to buy more energy intensive things. Uh, but then as that supply constraint exists, that will be a persistent inflationary pressure going forward. And so, for example, if you look at slide five, that shows the five year rolling cumulative changes in both oil and CPI over time. And that, that chart goes back well over a century. And what you generally see is a very strong correlation between energy prices and broader inflation, with the notable exception being the 2000s. Uh, that, that was the biggest decoupling we've had. We had basically rather high energy prices without the level of inflation we'd expect from those high energy prices. And that was because our other disinflationary factors were so strong. Uh, that was kind of at the at the peak rate of globalization. So we were we were aggressively pushing jobs out to China. We were tapping into this large untapped pool of labor throughout the developing world. And so we had these big offsets that we could offset inflation with. You know, it didn't it didn't necessarily translate into sharply rising domestic wages. Uh, it didn't sh- translate into sharply rising manufacturing costs because we had all these offsets as well as just rapid technological growth. But I think that we're going to be unable to repeat that this time around, that basically, you know, we're no longer have, you know, China's already quite developed. They already have, you know, potentially a, popula- a working population peak in place. They're already rather, you know, developed in that sense. And we don't have a lot of other levers in, in, to basically offset some of this inflation with. And so I think going forward, we're going to see a tighter relationship between money supply growth and CPI because we don't really have those offsets to, to work through. Lynn, as we're speaking on uh, Tuesday midday, energy markets are outright crashing. Crude oil literally down over $7 on the day. We haven't quite tested that 95 spot 10 level that we got to last week, but as I'm speaking now, we're just above $96, so uh, about a dollar away from it. Now, it was OPEC's announcement that they increased their production by 234,000 barrels per day in June that seems to have been the proximal catalyst for this. But bigger picture, What we're seeing here is a tug of war between increasing recession fears, which are causing the macro traders to really say, okay, sell crude oil. Recession's coming. Got got to sell crude oil. Don't don't want it anymore. And the other side of that is the physical market, as indicated by the time spreads, is just screaming out a, a bullish signal, which is the time spreads are really tight. The physical market is tight. We don't have enough physical oil, recession or no recession. How do we make sense of this, Lynn? It's clearly a balancing act, but if you're trying to trade this, what do you do? Because you don't know when the next headline is going to come out, as happened this morning, that causes the market to drop by 8 or $9 in a matter of a few hours. Uh, on the other hand, I think you and I agree that there's a very, very bullish longer-term picture. How do you weigh that recession risk and the perceptions in the marketplace about that recession risk against the, uh, the supply situation that you and I both see is really getting critical? Uh, that's a good question. I think the way to manage it is to basically uh, try to run a conservative book, right? Because the, we, we are at a period where headlines can sharply influence the price up and down. And so my energy thesis is less based on what it could do in any any given multi-month period. Basically, if you suppress demand enough for a sharp period of time, you could potentially reach uh, you know kind of a, a pretty low energy prices briefly. I think the bigger picture thing to focus on is is you know as we go forward, where's the where's the brand new supply going to come from? So as you point out, we have we have some variables from OPEC, for example. We also have variables related to the war. We also have variables related to the strategic petroleum reserve. We also have uh, variables related to Chinese lockdowns, right? So the two biggest countries in the world, the United States and China, 
are basically affecting the oil price in different ways. The United States is releasing oil into the market, and China is reducing its consumers' oil demand, basically less jet fuel, less less gasoline usage. Basically, they're by by having those pretty extensive lockdowns, they're they're you know kind of holding their demand suppressed, and so those two big impacts are you know temporarily bearish. And then there are, you know, there's always these like marginal spare capacities that can come online. But I think that as we look out past this period, basically when, when you know, we get into recession, the Fed's unable to keep tightening, I think basically we'd have energy come back pretty quickly. So the way I, I described it in a recent newsletter is it's kind of like, you know, if you run away from a monster and hide in the closet, that monster can just wait outside the closet until you come back out. And I think that's that's essentially what we're doing by reducing demand in in the face of a, a supply problem, right? So by basically by China reducing their own demand, by the Fed trying to tighten policy and cut demand off, this can temporarily suppress energy prices. Maybe it doesn't make them go down sharply. Maybe it makes them go sideways and choppy for a period of time. You know that can that can do things in the near term that are not very bullish. Uh, but basically, I think that whenever major central banks you know encounter a recession and try to stimulate again. We would have energy prices come back pretty rapidly because the supply side problems are still there. And so I, I think until those supply side problems are addressed, we're going to be basically in an inflationary situation. So even in inflationary decades, like say the 1970s, you still had disinflationary periods within an otherwise inflationary decade because there are there always are attempts by policymakers and things like that to, to fight back against what's happening. I think that's what we're seeing now. And I think it's important for investors to realize it's not just the production of oil and gas. It's also the transportation of oil and gas to where it needs to go uh, based on you know pipelines or LNG capacity uh, and things like that, as well as refining capacity in order to turn it into the products we actually use uh, as the end user and where we need to use them. Uh, and so basically, it's the whole energy complex, for the most part, that is underinvested in. And that this is going to be a, a constraint for, I, I think, years to come. And trading that, I think, in, is basically you know about risk management because there, when you have such strong variables, both to the upside and the downside, you can get these surprising breaks up. You can get surprising breaks down. And I think it'll, it'll reward investors that kind of stick through it and maintain that kind of a cautious, long exposure as we look out into the years ahead. Lynn, I really want to drill down on what you just said about until those supply concerns have been addressed, because what I don't see is how they're going to be addressed, because we've got a situation where OPEC has admitted that they're basically out of spare capacity. The U.S. shale industry is doing its very best and is amazing everyone with how well they're doing, given the uh, uphill battle that they're fighting with respect to their government policy, not really supporting them. But it's still not enough, and I don't expect it to become enough. And the problem is that producing resources will continue to decline. That's just the way oil wells work. They don't continue to produce the same amount of oil. It's always going down, and you always have to drill new oil wells in order to replace the old ones. And as you said, Lynn, investing in this stuff. It's almost uninvestable because of the ESG movement, because people are concerned about the longevity of the industry. And obviously, in, in the long term, we will eventually, as a civilization, will solve this problem by electrifying the economy, uh, getting rid of internal combustion engines, and, and so forth. But that is a solution that will occur in a time frame measured in decades, not months or quarters or years. So in the sense of months, quarters, and years, how is the supply problem going to be addressed? What can be done to solve it? So the short answer, I think, is that it's going to take years and years to solve the problem. I think I think this is going to be a story that, that lives with us for most of this decade. It's not something we're going to solve by next year or the year thereafter. Basically, nothing short of, of large CapEx expenditures on a persistent basis will be able to solve this. And you know, when something gets bad enough, you start to get feedback loops, right? So if you go into severe stagflationary types of recessions, uh, eventually people, you know, rotate out some of the policies that, that contributed to that until they find leaders 
putting in new policies into effect. And so, for example, I, I think the United States will eventually uh, uptick its, its energy production, at least to a mild degree. Um, and I don't think that's you know necessarily right around the quarter, but I think that as you look out a number of years, uh, I think that as the situation becomes more and more untenable, we'll, we'll eventually bring some more supply online. I also think that there are more unconventional things that they can draw into over time, uh, for example, in Canada, or they can also go offshore. I think right now, we're seeing that, as you point out, a lot of private entities don't necessarily want to put a long-term capital into this. Uh, right now, you know, the market's basically telling them, like, you know, oil price is high now, but this is all transfer. It's going to go back down. And so there's not a lot of incentive to go out and spend billions of dollars on these long-term projects to bring long-term supply online, uh, as well as transportation and refining capacity. So I basically, I think that the longer the prices persist in these big, high, choppy levels, the more it will dawn on, on private entities that, yes, that the, this is a longer term problem and that you can safely put you know long term capital at work um, once you start to see that jurisdictions are shifting their view due to voter backlash and, and persistent stagflationary pressures. So, you know, I think I think Rick rules the one that, you know, often says that bear markets are the authors of bull markets and bull markets are the authors of bear markets. And right now we're kind of su- suppressing the ability of, of, of markets to come in and address the, the price pressures that we're seeing. But I think that the longer that grinds out over time, eventually that will change politics, that will change public perception, and then that will change private investment, at, le- at least in a number of jurisdictions where it starts to matter. But again, I think that's a multi-year story. I don't think that, I don't think that this problem is going to be addressed anytime soon. Lynn, as we speak here in July of uh, 2022, Open interest in crude oil futures is crashing like it's March of 2020. And I don't say that figuratively. I'm looking at a chart courtesy of our friend Ola Hansen at Saxo Bank, who tracks the commitment of traders reports very actively. And we're literally seeing the abandonment of speculative interest in crude oil futures. So all of that speculative long interest is coming out of the market. Does that mean that we're close to a bottom in energy prices, uh, or are there more factors that could drive us even lower? Particularly, uh, I know you follow the recession cycle very closely. Uh, are we about to get even more bad news recession-wise? I think we're going to appear, been a, a period of economic weakness for a while. So um, in a recent report, I even talked about, I mean, oil, oil could go down to 70 or 80 potentially. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked to see a sharp dip in energy prices. It's not, it's not something I'm calling for, but basically, if you if they do manage to destroy enough demand, there, there's variables that are outside of our current, say, forecasting capacity. You know, what if what if China goes even stricter on certain lockdowns? What if the U.S. Uh, and Europe does encounter an absolutely severe recession, and policymakers push that as hard as they can on the demand destruction side? You can certainly get these, uh, you know, brief periods of of wild price swings in, in either direction. Uh, I think the the situation then becomes, what is the feedback loop from there? And I think that there'd be then uh, another reversal, another response, because you would start to get breaking financial markets, breaking treasury markets, you know, basically a collapse in in tax revenue, uh, resulting in all sorts of liquidity problems uh, in in some of the core markets of the financial system. And so I think they'd end up reversing course again if they were to encounter something that severe. And so uh, I think that there, there's really no headlines I'd be surprised on that can drive oil below 80 or, or above 120 next week, right? There's all sorts of things that can that can adjust where oil goes in the short term. I think the bigger story to focus on is where does it have to go long term and what levels does it have to stay at long term in order to ever bring new supply online and to change policies around allowing new supply to come online. And so I think it's a great thing that speculation is being washed out of the industry. You know, as, as kind of an inherent contrarian, I always get concerned when something I've been talking about becomes consensus. Uh, I get concerned about locally overbought periods. And so I do like it when a market gets flushed once in a while because that basically helps price discovery happen again. We actually see where the fundamentals are. So if, if a lot of macro people are looking at recession signals and they get out of their position, well, we can still see what's happening in physical markets. And then over time, that that drives the price. Uh, and so I think that basically when we look at past this period of turbulence, I'm still bullish on energy prices. And if you look at oil equities, for example, or 
transport equities, like you know the midstream sector, I, I still think that area is pretty attractive when you look out long term. I mean, most of those prices didn't go up to reflect you know hundred hundred dollar plus oil, and they're they're basically still pricing in as though oil is going to come back down and natural gas is going to come back down and we're going to go back to the normal we had over the past five years. And I think that's the part that's quite unlikely. Um, so I, I think that basically if we have somewhat of a counter-cyclical approach, you know, careful cash management, lev- leverage management, I, I think as we look out, this is still plenty of bullish opportunity either in directly in oil, oil and natural gas themselves or in some of the equities that are involved in their production and transportation. Let's move on to the recession cycle because you study that quite actively. Uh, I've been telling our listeners for months now that uh, I thought a recession was nearly certain because the Fed basically needs one in order to fight inflation. Um, how close are we in terms of the recession actually happening? You know, for, when I first started saying that, it was a, a nutcase conspiracy theorist view. Now it's getting a little more consensus, but it's certainly not mainstream in the sense of people expecting that a recession is a near certainty, which has been my view for you know a couple of months now. Uh, how close are we to the, the mainstream really realizing this? And particularly, how deep do you think this recession is likely to be? How long do you expect it to last in comparison with where we are now in terms of consensus expectations? So if you look at leading indicators and coincident indicators, you know, it's, it's arguable that we're in the early phases of recession already. I mean, we, we, you know, we've had uh, potentially two negative quarters of real GDP growth. A number of the forward looking indicators are very, very soft, especially when you look at things in real terms rather than nominal terms. Uh, you know, people are basically buying fewer goods when you factor out the fact that the prices of those goods are much higher. So basically, the, the, the amount of stuff that they're taking home from the store is, is diminished compared to where it was a year ago. This, the part of the economy that's still pretty sticky, that's still pretty strong, is the labor market. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of factors that go into that, but it's important to realize that that's often a lagging indicator, uh, that that's something that, you know, basically rolls over once you're pretty much already in a recession or, you know, about to enter one. And so I think that we're, we're seeing early signs of some softness in the labor market. We've obviously seen a lot of layoffs by tech companies specifically. We've also seen, you know, a reversal in the trend. We, we had, you know, a long period of lower and lower uh, initial jobless claims. And now we're starting to see kind of a, a, a mild rise in jobless claims. And so I think we're encountering a somewhat softer job market that has not rolled over yet. I also think it's important to look at the real wage component. And so for example, you know, jobs have not really started shedding yet, but if you look at the the median worker, their wages went up more slowly than inflation over the past year. So instead of kind of like firing people, we basically have given everybody a, a, a pay cut in real terms, right? So it often in that sense feels like a recession, even though you don't have the job losses yet. And I think that's one one thing to kind of look at this is through that that inflationary lens. I think that a lot of analysts are used to looking at nominal numbers because inflation component was not a very large part of the nominal number over the past several decades. But now that inflation is such a big component of the nominal number, I think that that can disguise some of the problems that we're seeing in the real numbers, the inflation adjusted numbers. And so I think that many workers, you know, they've already gotten a real pay cut. I think the job market is showing some signs of weakening, and I think that you know by the end of the year we're we're in what is basically a recession. As to the severity and length of it, that will partially depend on what policymakers do, and it'll partially depend on what happens with headline factors like wars and and what happens with some of these you know severe energy bottlenecks. I think that this is going to resemble a more of a stagflationary type of recession, where you know, instead of like a big deflationary bust, you get more of a grinding malaise, something like we saw in the 70s or something like, uh, you know, people experiencing the hardship of the 1940s, where it's different than to say the recession of the Chesney crisis or different than the recession of the early 2000s and more along the lines of that uh, inflationary and kind of scarcity driven mindset type of recession. And so I think that a lot of things could chop along nominally sideways, right? So for example, you can get you could get a you know a nine percent reduction in real corporate earnings and still have flat nominal corporate earnings because you have such a large inflation component. Basically the money supply itself 
is so much larger. And so the unit of account that you're measuring things in has diminished. So I think that we're in probably a large choppy kind of a, a you know malaise going forward for, for a period of time until you start to see a reversal of some of these supply side constraints, which I don't think is happening anytime soon. Um, so I think right now we're, we're entering what is kind of like a disinflationary move within what is otherwise uh, a very inflationary situation. So some of the supply bottlenecks have been addressed. Uh, demand in some areas has been destroyed enough. We've seen the housing market seize up. We've seen durable goods seize up. And so some of that should be somewhat disinflationary, even as things like you know uh, the housing component of CPI is still coming up with a lag. And even though, as we've discussed, uh, we still have uh, severe problems on the energy side. And so I think that this is going to be one of those longer and and more stagflationary types of recessions. Lynn, as we're speaking on Tuesday, commodities are outright crashing, which seems to very strongly confirm the recession expectations that you and I both share. But hang on, the stock market is really hanging in pretty well. As I look at S&P futures right now, uh, they're basically flat on the day and just just a hair above their short-term moving averages. The chart is really not looking that bad, but commodities are crashing. So if the reason commodities are crashing is because a recession is coming, why not equities? Well, equities often take their time and then, and then factor everything in at once. And so, for example, you know, in the, in the run-up to COVID, equities were kind of like the last to get the memo that this virus is actually going to be a pretty serious factor uh, globally. We saw it expressing commodities first, uh, and then it took you know equities uh, a while to see it. And then, of course, once equities saw it, they pretty much saw it all at once. And I think that equities are getting a partial reprieve from the perception that that you know rates uh, might be topping, or at least they're going up. You know, longer-term rates are going up more slowly than they were before. Basically, that they're you know you know some of the forward expectations of Fed hawkishness. Uh, some of the most hawkish expectations are probably being taken off the table, even as the Fed itself is still hiking. And so the equity market is kind of balancing those factors. It's also, you know, it went down pretty sharply in the first half of the year. And so sometimes, you know, you just get a natural bear market sideways move or bear market rally until you have further weakness. And I've also, I've been separating OPEX commodities from CAPEX commodities. So basically, you know, OPEX commodities would be ones we need on a regular basis you know, pretty much regards what we're doing and, and, and oil and other energy commodities would be in that basket. Basically, even in a recession, we're still driving, we're still using the majority of, this, of the, the energy we need. Whereas we look at a CapEx commodity like copper that is heavily involved in the construction cycle, you know, I've been a lot less bullish in the tactical sense on those CapEx type of commodities because that's where you see that really show up in the recession data. You know, copper to gold ratios, for example, have always been a really good proxy for economic growth globally. If you kind of overlay a copper and gold chart on a, a PMI, purchasing managers index chart, they're basically the same chart. You get this like sine wave of economic acceleration and deceleration. And just about every indicator we look at suggests deceleration across the board. And so I think that we, we, we've already seen part of the equity move in the sense that valuations compressed as we saw the sharp rise in, in rates. And I think the second leg to be aware of is the earnings weakness that is likely coming at as, as basically businesses are facing cost pressures. And then due to the weak, you know, low sentiment consumer, they have trouble passing those price increases on to the consumer. And so they face squeezing margins and, and weaker earnings. And that could translate into another much lower low in equities, or it could it could cause like just multi-year choppy sideways action that basically, you know, bleeds out in real terms while being, say, you know, this, this kind of big sideways band in nominal terms. It's always hard to predict where sentiment is going to push things around. But I think that the whole second leg to follow that we've not really, the equity market's not really touched yet is that weaker earnings side. Lynn, let's drill down on copper because you mentioned that just a minute ago. Uh, it seems to me like, you know, we got a recession coming. Dr. Copper always sells off when there's a recession coming. I think the recession is going to be longer and deeper than most people expect. That would suggest that copper has farther to go to the downside from here. But hold on. 
when I stop and think about the longer term view, you and I both share an inflationary longer term outlook. And I'm convinced that long term, I mean, we really do need the electric vehicle movement. The you know climate change is a real issue. Uh, I think that the priority that was placed on the climate agenda is going to be diminished as a result of the pain that it's causing at the, at the gas pumps. But at some point, we are going to need to make the investment in electrifying the economy. And demand for copper is going to be off the charts. So I passionately want to buy, you know, back up the leverage truck and buy the very bottom of this move in copper, which I'm sure is not here quite yet. How do I know when it is here? Well, it's always hard to time the exact bottom, but I think that, you know, with copper, as you point out, we have to keep in two separate time frames. So long term, I'm very bullish on copper. Uh, you know, when we're looking back five, 10 years from now, I think copper is going to be much higher in dollar terms than it is now. But copper is a pretty discretionary metal. Uh, it's heavily involved in construction and it, it's heavily tied to economic activity. And so I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm neutral to bearish on it in any sort of like near term sense until we start to see a reversal in some of these indicators. So in order for me to want to buy copper, uh, or copper producers uh, again and be more aggressive long. I want to see a turnaround in the PMIs, right? So I want to see that this period of economic deceleration gets behind us, and then we start to see that that early signs of turning around and moving back up. We can also look at things like the copper to gold ratio, and then you can you can use that ratio chart, and you can similarly look at at reversals in momentum. So, you know, if you're looking at the longer term chart, like the weekly chart, you're basically looking for these, these, you know, more structural shifts where we've been in copper has been going down compared to gold uh, in recent months. And, you know, when you get to kind of that bottom of that trend, you start to see a reversal. Uh, that's when I think you can more aggressively go long copper. And these cycles can always surprise you the upside and downside. I mean, back in, in mid 2020, I was analyzing copper producers and, and buying them pretty aggressively. And I expected them to, you know, to hold them for a number of years, but then copper and the copper producers rose so quickly and became so euphoric that I ended up trimming them a lot earlier than I, you know, otherwise would have. And now we've seen this big pullback. I would absolutely love to get back into that that trade uh, longer term. And you know, as I point out, I just want to see signs that I don't think we're pretty much anywhere near close to of the bottom of the PMI cycle and the bottom of the, you know, the kind of the the copper to gold ratio chart. Lynn, we've talked about recession and inflation. Uh, recessions tend to bring lower interest rates. Inflation tends to bring higher interest rates. Uh, what should we expect here? So that's the normal pattern that investors are used to expecting. And the exceptions to that pattern tend to be so long ago that they're outside of most people's radars. And so, for example, I have on slide two, it shows the inflations of the 1940s and the 1970s side by side as well as the short-term interest rates of the 40s and the 70s side by side. And what you saw in the 70s is pretty much what you'd expect logically, that interest rates generally followed inflation levels, um, especially by the end of the decade as, as Paul Volcker tried to break the back of inflation. But even prior to him, there was still this pretty tight correlation between rates and inflation. Whereas we look back in the 40s, uh, you saw a complete detachment where you had, you had super high inflation, but you still had low interest rates. And that in large part comes down to debt levels. Basically, when, when, you know, when societies are heavily indebted, like they were in the 1940s, but they were not in the 1970s, that's when you're likely to get that decoupling of interest rates and uh, inflation, uh, and that leads to you know kind of structural currency devaluation. We're already seeing that to to some extent in Europe and Japan. So for example, Japan right now is doing yield curve control despite the fact that they have inflationary pressures. Uh, when you have a 250% sovereign debt to GDP, they don't really have a choice other than to have persistently negative real yields. And then we look at Europe, for example, they're facing an acute energy crisis, high inflation. But when they have countries like Italy with 150% debt to GDP, again, there's ba that's basically untenable in real terms, right? So, so bondholders in those types of countries are going to get defaulted on one way or another. It could either be nominally, which is unlikely to happen when, a, when an entity can print its own currency, or it can happen in real terms where everybody takes a haircut. It's kind of like a restructuring except everybody gets paid back every currency unit that they're owed, uh, and just that those currency units are worth a lot less than they used to. So you know, holders of those bonds will be able to buy less energy, less food, 
uh, less house, whatever you want to call it, in the in the future over the long run. And I think that the Fed is is basically going to encounter a similar situation pretty soon, uh, when they have you know roughly 130 percent debt to GDP, and you have pretty high private debts, pretty high corporate debts, and the economy itself is so financialized and tax revenues are so tied to rising asset prices. I think they're also going to run into a situation where they're unlikely to be able to raise rates as high as they want to in the face of this inflation. We also see these kind of negative feedback loops where if you have a big decoupling between the Federal Reserve's policy and then policies from other major central banks, then obviously that leads to dollar tightening. And so, for example, the recent dollar strength we've seen is less about the dollar specifically. So, we, for example, we don't see a massive breakout in, in U.S. dollars versus Canadian dollars. Uh, you know, the, the dollar versus the renminbi is still below its, its 2020 highs. We don't see huge breakouts a- across the board, but we do specifically see a breakout against the euro and the yen because those are currently being unusually weak currencies due to their circumstances. But nonetheless, when you start to see significant dollar strength, which in part is what we're seeing now, um, you, you generally start to see less buying from foreigners of treasuries. Basically, they're squeezed in various ways, and they're unable to keep cycling their trade surpluses back into U.S. capital markets. And so on slide seven there, I show, you know, on the left chart there, you have the broad dollar index in blue, and you have foreign treasury holdings at the Fed, which is the most rapidly updating data we have on, on that subject. That's in red. And you see a pretty strong inverse correlation. So when you have a, a, a dollar move up, especially if it's disorderly, a dollar strengthening environment, you generally get less foreign buying. And the feedback loop there is that that means that the U.S. domestic economy has to absorb more of the fiscal deficits. So the U.S. banking system, you know, pensions, U.S. households, uh, or the Fed, these, these entities end up having to absorb more of the fiscal deficits. And at the current time, uh, in the middle of this year, there's not a lot of net treasury issuance. And so the Treasury Department is in a pretty good shape at the moment, even though we're seeing rising illiquidity and rising volatility in the Treasury market uh, from some of these lack of buyers. But I think as we look out into 2023, when weak asset prices translate into weak tax revenues, and uh, as we likely see a persistently uh, you know, lack of foreign bid for Treasuries, I think they're going to run into more acute liquidity problems in the Treasury market. And then in order to solve that, there's basically a number of things they can do. So, for example, the Fed can stop raising rates. They can turn to QE. Uh, that's obviously pretty bad optically if inflation is still you know, a problem at that time. They can also do things like adjust SLR uh, requirements for banks to allow the commercial banking system to buy more treasuries. That's actually you know, something they really did in the 1940s. The U.S. commercial banking system was a big financier of the the high federal debts that were that were done during World War II, and I think we'll probably see a similar thing this decade. And so basically, as we kind of call this right now, the Fed is doing their best to push back on inflation, but essentially due to how high debt levels are, I think that by next year, regardless of what inflation numbers are, they're going to have trouble to continue tightening. And that's when you could get, say, the next leg up in, in oil prices or Potentially, that's when you could see a bottoming in, in copper prices and another roundup. Those are the types of environments I'd be looking for to be, be more structurally long, some of those CapEx types of commodities. Well, Lynn, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview and a terrific slide deck. But before I let you go, please tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do at Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, what services you offer to investors, and how they can follow your work and find out more about what you do. So I'm active at lindalden.com. I have a, a variety of public articles and newsletters, and then also have a, a, a research service, pretty low cost, and it covers macro and individual investment opportunities. And that, that's, that's mainly both for a sophisticated retail audience and for an institutional audience. Um, and I'm also active on Twitter at Lindalden Contact if they want to follow for, for charts and, and kind of just observations throughout the week. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this. After being completely sold out of advertising space for the last couple of years, we finally have capacity to add a new advertiser. Macro Voices has a PodTrack certified global audience of over 170,000 listeners, and each weekly episode typically gets 60,000 to 80,000 downloads. 
We have more than 20,000 accredited investors who have registered with us as accredited, and we estimate the total accredited investor audience as at least 40,000 accredited listeners, which we believe to be the highest number of accredited investor listeners of any podcast on the Internet. We strive to accept tasteful advertising from advertisers whose product is likely to appeal to our audience. So we're looking for another investment or financial services advertiser to fill the space I'm speaking in right now. Mail order Viagra salesmen need not apply. If your company wants to advertise on Macrovoices, please email sponsorship at macrovoices.com for more information. Now let's get right back to the show. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it's great to have Lynn back on the show. You know what? what it really it was interesting that you guys dive right into the whole energy issue. And, you know, I, I agree in principle that, the, that no matter how you can uh, manipulate short term prices of energy by releasing, you know, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve or you turn around and drive a recession that causes demand to go down. But overall, there is a fundamental problem with the, uh, the supply of energy. And uh, that's going to more than and likely lead to a sustained secular bull market in the commodity. And uh, I thought she really put it together well. Patrick, I agree. Lynn really has an excellent perspective. And I got to tell you, the, the strongest comment that I can make on this situation, and forgive me for editorializing a little bit more, folks, you know, we've got really, really critical situations in energy markets. And as a crude oil trader, you would think that my focus of all my energy personally would be a boy, how much money can I make on, on this thing? Because I really do think I've got a pretty strong understanding of why what's happening is happening and what's about to happen next. And honestly, Patrick, I'm really not that focused on how much money I can make off on this. I am deeply, deeply concerned about the national security of the United States because I think the mistakes that are being made greatly jeopardize the security of the country and the vulnerability to an economically focused new war with Russia and China, which could really, really, really put us in a difficult situation. And if I were in charge, despite what it would do to the markets and the prices, if I were president, I would say we have to immediately replenish the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, fill it up to the brim no matter what the cost, because we got to be ready for what maybe is going to be coming in the next year or two. Anyway, let's move on to the post-game chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads. Patrick, perspective on market breadth. Page two, we have, as normal, a S&P 500 chart. How come it's not 500 points lower? I don't get it. Eric, the question of as to why the market's now down another 500 points, I mean, a lot of think, people, I think, are expecting this to play out the way March 2020 did, where it's just a crash and it instantly all uh, comes together in one shot. But uh, what has been uh, consistent throughout the since the start of the year is that this has been a grind lower, and it hasn't been an easy short. Every time you try to short this market, the market just uh, theta burns you and chews you up a little bit, and yet still finds a way to go down and uh, just because it's not manifesting in one big volatile downwards uh, crash doesn't mean the market isn't going to work its way lower in, in a period of high inflation high interest rates and tight monetary policy there is uh, a prevailing downtrend that is uh, very natural in that environment and I don't see any reason why you know one would deviate from that but with that said when we look at the chart the one thing that we were highlighting over the last two weeks was the fact that the market needed to clear 4,000 in order for the bulls to in any way even demonstrate that they had uh, some sort of uh, uh, you know buying strength to reverse the tr uh, the prevailing trends and what's been continuing on over and over again is failed rally, uh, failed rally, uh, 
rolling over, rolling over. It's just not it, a catalyst for buying has not yet emerged. And uh, maybe that uh, may increase the chance that this is a little bit more sideways price action. But uh, I still think that the vulnerability down to 3,500 or 3,400 is real. Now that we're in the OPEX uh, option expiration week, which typically can uh, pin markets in these kind of conditions, uh, it'll be interesting when we start seeing those earnings coming out ne- uh, over the next couple of weeks, whether or not that becomes that catalyst for another uh, 10% downside to kind of move. But what I wanted to uh, really highlight here Eric, on pages three, four, and five is just uh, look at everything from sentiment to some breath indicators to really kind of gauge as to are we truly oversold enough to call this a bottom. Uh, Now, when the uh, CNN uh, fear greed index, we're at about 22, uh, uh, which is their uh, extreme fear reading. But uh, when you really break it down to some of the different components, yeah, you know, things like, for instance, credit spreads in the high yield junk bond market are widening, but they're still lots of room to go on different things. VIX is not really above its 50-day moving average or the other types of things that uh, would typically be associated with a true blow-off bottom. So we're not seeing, in my opinion, extreme fear the way that this reading is saying. Now, if you look even on something like uh, the New York Stock Exchange percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving averages, we're hovering around 22%, but we're far off from the lows that were established in May and June. And so while the markets are trading with a stone's throw of their uh, trading low of the year, we still are not seeing these extreme readings, which typically would be associated with a tradable market low. When we look on page five, I have the bullish percentage index on the S&P 500. And while uh, we did a few months ago experience a very sharp sell-off downwards, uh, we still, again, are not showing any extreme readings, at least not at this moment, that are, that are showing that capitulation. And so I just feel like this market is still vulnerable. And while, yeah, you're right, it didn't have its feet kicked out for a you know 500-point drop uh, in short order, I also don't see a reason, though, for it to start going up here. And uh, until some catalyst emerges that way, I think the right thing to do is respect the prevailing trends, uh, which are still very distinctly uh, uh, pointing to weaker markets. Patrick, I definitely agree that stock markets ought to be headed much lower. I, I also thought the euro was likely to uh, to trade off. And boy, let's take a look at page six. Uh, you warned us that if we saw a break below that support level that had been holding for a couple of months, you look out below. Well, guess what? We're there. We're below parity. Uh, I think I mentioned on the show a couple of weeks ago, d- despite whatever you learned about efficient markets and professionals and so forth, there's an emotional factor here. Below low parity. It's the first time it's happened in 20 years. It's going to freak people out. I I predicted it might accelerate the selling from there. We'll see what happens. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there. When you go to much bigger picture charts like uh, weekly and monthly charts, there is at this point uh, uh, some different measured targets that you could take down to even ninety or ninety-five cents. But I'm not, not so certain or confident that that's a reasonable short-term target. Maybe next year or something like that. But the the key. Uh, here is is that I I think that with this kind of a pronounced downtrend in the euro and more importantly the fact that we are seeing a recession in Europe as well as all sorts of issues emerging uh, I think that uh, Europe will need uh, uh, some sort of change in their macro conditions in order for the sentiment to shift for money to flow back to Europe. And so while we're quite oversold and we could easily put together two, 300 pip reaction the other way uh, after the headline prints uh, showing all the parity uh, being hit, uh, I still think that uh, this downtrend can stay uh, in place for months to come. And uh, a big tell will be how, how strong it bounces and where it goes. And that's certainly something on my mind. Patrick, before we move on, I just want to point out a possible outlier here on the euro US dollar chart, which is that a number of analysts have said, if Putin were to actually cut Europe off from gas intentionally 
in order to tank their economy. Germany would be the hardest hit. Uh, it would it really just tank the entire European economy. They would be in really big trouble. And a lot of people think that could take the euro down to 90 cents even, uh, a full dime down from here, 10% lower from here. Now, I don't think that that's going to happen until at least October for reasons that I stated in the uh, market wrap before the feature interview. But what I do think is quite possible is the scheduled restart of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline next Friday on the 22nd of July. Let's assume that that gets delayed just for entirely legitimate logistical reasons. They've got this problem with the turbine, whatever it is. I think that a whole bunch of people are likely to panic and say, oh my gosh, the doomsday scenario that I read about on internet blogs is happening. We've been cut off from gas. Europe is about to go into the dark ages. Uh, You know, horrible. Now, I'm not saying that can't happen. I, I think it doesn't happen until October. But a bunch of people might very well freak out and think it's starting to happen. Uh, sometime around next Friday or the the following uh, few days, if it doesn't get turned on, that could result in another really big wave down in the euro. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, Eric, we got to get to that crude oil chart. I know you uh, uh, were highlighting a lot of your views in the market wrap at the beginning. But let's just technically observe some interesting observations. The, the, uh, the sell-off that we saw here that happened over the last two, three trading sessions that wiped uh, crude oil from basically around $105 little intraday high uh, down to, uh, to the 90 handle is now testing, interestingly, uh, the lows that were uh, put in during the March sell-off after uh, the uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, confrontation pop that uh, saw crude oil uh, uh, move higher. So we're now uh, at the stage where uh, there are, we're starting to give back now about 50% of the entire rally we've done throughout the since the start of the year and so this is a really interesting level like i know that uh, there are some that mention that we could see even eighty dollars or lower on a short-term basis but i actually think this $90 $90 area was the area that I thought was going to actually be a very reasonable place where crude oil could put in a low, but I didn't expect it to get here this quickly. And I think that's what the part that makes me a little nervous about is that even though the, the price level is interesting to me, the fact that it got here in just a couple of days uh, makes me ask the question as to whether or not uh, there might still just be a more liquidity driven selling that does some sort of a little more of a washout here. Uh, what's your thinking technically on this? Well, since we're talking about technical phenomena, I want to point something out that I think is probably likely to happen next week. And it has to do with the expiration of the August contract when we have this much backwardation in the system. So right now, as I'm speaking, the August crude oil contract, that's the front month contract, is around $95.50. Well, because we have such wide time spreads, right now as I'm speaking, I'm looking at two spot 86, so almost $3 of difference between the August and September contracts. That means that the September contract is only trading at $92.50, $3 lower than August. Now, if you believe in efficient markets and supposedly everybody's a professional and knows how this stuff works, when When the front month price suddenly drops by $3 just because the August contract expires next week. So it's not that the price of the September contract went down by $3. It's just that September became the front month contract. In other words, the price hasn't changed at all. But the advertised price that you see, you know, when you get your quote is $3 lower than you remember it being yesterday. People tend to say, oh, my gosh, the price went down by three bucks. And I'm, I'm, when I say people, I mean, including professional investors who are supposed to be paid to know better. Usually what happens when we get that is it's a buy the dip. They say, oh, my gosh, it dipped three dollars Buy that dip. I want to buy it. In this environment, I think it could be perceived as, oh, my gosh, it went down another three bucks. Well, it didn't actually move at all. It's just a contract expired. It's a technicality that you're supposed to understand if this is what you do for a living. But not everybody does. It's gone down three bucks. It's no longer a, a 90 something handle. Maybe it's an 89 because, you know, it's still traded a little bit lower from where it is now. And, and all of a sudden it's an 80 something and people really start to panic. So that three dollar difference or the three dollar move lower in price that happens just as a function of the August contract expiring, I, I think could lead to some emotional reactions by traders.
And beyond that, Patrick, you know, I could go on for hours on crude oil and what I think. Uh, I did talk to George Gammon quite a bit a lot about a lot of these issues. There's a link in the research roundup to that interview. Why don't we leave it there? Eric, let's just move on to page eight here where uh, we have silver. And I wanted to simply highlight uh, that while gold has been weakening down to its uh, support lines and where it put in 2021 lows, you know, in that 1700 level and more or less, uh, we uh, see silver, on the other hand, go through quite an awful downdraft. I mean, we blew through the 2021 lows back in May. And really, uh, silver just has not looked back. I mean, we've seen some incredible selling. I know that uh, Julian was talking about uh, some levels around 19, but this selling continues to be so intense. And we're so looking like we're heading down to those uh, mid-teen levels on the downside. But uh, I'm, I'm starting to think that this is now going to be an interesting buy on dip at some point. The question really is, where is the, uh, the short-term swing bottom going to emerge? And, and will it just continue to be a story of the U.S.? dollar that's driving this. Well, Patrick, my hesitation there, I, I agree with everything you said in principle, but I think the silver market in particular has a lot of weak hands in it. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but the, the same generation that's into crypto has been on this Wall Street silver kick. And I think that there's a lot of younger investors who thought silver could only go up. And as we're seeing this phenomenon of both gold and silver going down, uh, I think potentially just as crypto got hit harder than the stock market, which I think is probably a function of the experience level of the people who are trading it, I wouldn't be surprised if there is room for a really deep washout, let's say down to 12 bucks or so on silver. Now, if that happens, yeah, it's definitely a bargain. You, you want to buy it. Uh, it, it it's, it's a real buying opportunity. But I see a lot of possibilities. Silver is famously much more volatile than gold. And I think there's plenty of room for it to really dump here. But let's move on to page nine, where we see the Bloomberg Commodity Index. What do we have here? Yeah, and Eric, I just simply wanted to highlight the uh, look at as a bigger basket of the uh, commodities. And what's interesting here is, is that the entire commodity complex was a, it had a, an extraordinarily bad uh, second quarter. And the only thing that actually kept these index higher was the fact that crude oil was doing so well. And it's such a huge weighting in this index. And what's, uh, what's particularly noteworthy is the fact that when crude oil started to break here a month ago, it um, uh, really has now trickled in to almost any metric that you're measuring of the entire commodity story. And uh, so we're really now in a very clear correction in the entire commodity space. And I think that that's an important thing to highlight. We're, we're now at a stage where, you know, US dollar up and it's like bonds, equities and commodities are all now getting hammered and it's uh, it's a scenario where there's pretty much no safe havens left and uh, and I think that that's uh, going to continue to play an important factor from a sentiment perspective let's move on to page 10 and the 10-year bond yield Eric, uh, one thing I wanted to just highlight, we were talking about whether or not that 10-year bond future was going to put in a bottom last week. And what I found really interesting was that uh, interest rates did not move on that CPI print, uh, at least not meaningfully. And uh, I kind of asked that question, well, you know, if uh, a rising dollar and subsequently uh, a proper uh, inflation scare, the way that CPI print came in, wasn't going to cause bonds to have another nasty sell-off or yields to blow out, uh, what will? I mean, it's starting to make me think uh, whether or not the, we've seen at least some short to intermediate high in those yields. It's not that next year or something that can't go higher and if the macro conditions change, but uh, it really feels like something uh, is established establishing itself uh, as, a, as a, a topping formation here in terms of how far we go with these yields. Listeners, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading, Patrick's trading service. Information is on page 11 of the slide deck, or you can just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Listeners, we sure appreciate your patience with a longer than usual podcast this week. But hey, as soon as the government stops putting our national security at risk, I'll shut up about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. In the meantime, we got to talk about it. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. 
Well, this week you're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed in the post game. There's also a, a number of links to articles that we found interesting, so you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at research roundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions if you have not already follow our main twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases you can also follow me on twitter at patrick serezna on behalf of eric townsend and myself thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>